welcome to money masters i'm here with another master who has 21 years of uh, you know visible asset money management experience i'm here with kenneth andrade whom i've known for 21 years he has been managing funds in some form or the, uh, or the other and uh, right now he runs a portfolio management company and uh, he's about to get a mutual fund license so soon you will have old bridge mutual fund available to you thank you dave thanks for having welcome. me on the show welcome kenneth and uh, I have a long list of questions for you. Uh, though some of the answers I know, but I thought of asking them all over again, uh, so that all, you know your answers are all at one place. Uh, so tell us about your beginnings in the world of investments. Sure, I mean, I've been around since 1990. Okay, yeah, okay. But my formal uh, fund management experience has been around since 2002. Mm -hmm. That's when I first joined Kotak, and uh, subsequently it's been a it's, it's been quite an incredible journey up to uh, Old Bridge. Old Bridge. Right. Um, so, 21 years of uh, fund management experience, uh, almost uh, 30 years of uh, capital market experience. Hopefully, all of this culminates into, all this experience culminates into what we, uh, into the next leg of journey, which is mm -hmm. our uh, asset management asset stroke management. mutual fund, uh, mutual fund, which hopefully should be launched by the end of this calendar year. Okay. What got you interested into this? Yeah, uh, in the 90s, when it, things were, you know, very pretty crude, it was before Harshad Mehta, uh, uh, the great Indian bit, scam. A little, a little bit and then um, uh, greed overtake takes us all, right? Mm -hmm. We are in the business of uh, uh, managing money, uh, making uh, or um, trying to deliver a higher return on investment over longer term periods. And that inquisitiveness and in how companies demonstrate the ability to make more profits and survive, mm -hmm. put them both together and that creates uh, great companies over long mm -hmm. terms. I think that's that, that's what the most interesting part of it is. And the only way as, a, as an individual you can participate in the journey is to participate to those companies. Invest and, in them. Yes, and invest in them. And India has seen a great degree of number of companies that have come through. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that's what got me started. Uh, and that's uh, how uh, I, I, I found that, that sweet spot of of how to how to choose some of these businesses and here i am today so it's just an it's just an inquisitiveness that turned into uh, a, in, into a, a, a hobby which just mm -hmm. turned into a profession and now it turns into an entrepreneurship or a, so being curious actually has taken you to all these directions yes i love mm -hmm. what i do mm -hmm. <laughs> tell me about you know uh, was there anybody who influenced you Oh, plenty of. Invest and uh, uh, I think uh, right through the journey, uh, there have been a number of individuals who uh, who who put put pieces of this puzzle together. Right? It's my uh, initial association with capital market, the journey, uh, and that was my first job in in capital market. Capital so market, the magazine. The magazine, yes, okay. the magazine, yes. And uh, they used to run. It still exists. It still exists, okay. and they used to run this large uh, 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 a large scoreboard, as they used mm -hmm. to call it, with financial parameters of. Yeah, Although 500 companies dissected plus. by sector. Yes, yes, and that's the only place to go go, go to place to get all financial numbers. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the best best part of of, of learning. So you started as a publisher and working in a publishing company. Yes, I started working in a publishing company. Uh, through the course, um, um, I mean, you that that was a phase of accumulating data. Mm -hmm. So you you looked at companies. You had an IPO boom. You had a bust, uh, and you accumulated a lot of data. The next, the, the next, the, the next assignment was uh, was how to how, how to utilize that data, mm -hmm. and that I think started off in in the late nineties all the way to two thousand two three, and then it was the portfolio management experience. So there's a gentleman um, who used to work as a manager in SRF, and I used to track SRF, and it was seventeen rupees of okay. stock price. His name was Sanjeev Pandya, who mm -hmm. was also associated with you. And uh, he introduced me the yeah, concept. He's been writing for me for, for our magazine since its beginning. Yes, and and he introduced me to the to, to, to the fundamentals of how companies survive through a down cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we always used to have very long debates about how the sugar cycle would last, how butter would come through, and the reasons why butter would come this? through. This is late nineties. Late nineties. Yes. Okay. 
and then uh, through uh, 2000 i met a gentleman who also ended up being a boss and our good friend veteran subramanian who who actually helped me practice uh, what 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 i did so i moved from theory data collection theory uh, to actually uh, interpretation of all that data and yes, i think as a as a fund manager as a portfolio manager yes yes okay. yes as a portfolio manager since 2003 and that was when uh, kotak uh, kotak mutual fund actually happened now the significant part of that small 3 years stint with kotak mutual fund was i was given a fund called kotak mnc to manage mm-hmm. and the stock universe was 51 companies okay okay so multinational companies that itself was an attribute yes uh, so you kn- and that was maybe a, in india at that time was being considered as a portfolio you know quality filter yes 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 yeah. but the universe was 51 companies and you had to create a portfolio out of that mm-hmm. that now that was that you couldn't work outside the box you had to work inside the box mm-hmm. of 51 companies and that helped me optimize the box okay okay and that was the process that started through just for the sake of you know understanding the context at that time mm. How difficult was procuring MNC company stocks in the market? Uh, it's a small fund, so I it's don't think small. liquidity was such was a big not that much. was such a big challenge. The second thing is that it cleared or kind of cleared corporate governance. It ticks the boxes mm-hmm. in terms of governance. Uh, the third was uh, market share, uh, market share, market dominance, and pro- mm-hmm. and and performance. Okay, uh, now you had to choose and every business went through multiple cycles. So I used my little bit of past experience with my cycles and then and and then try to optimize out of 50 companies, how many companies do you run? Mm-hmm. And in that product, if I remember right, we were running 15 companies. Only 15? One five. One five, yeah. yes. And that's how the concentration of, of, uh, of, of the portfolio set in. And with 15 companies, I think we did fairly well. Mm-hmm. If, if, if I'm not mistaken, we were, we were pretty much top quartilation amongst all diversified funds in, in the entire industry. But that's how the optimization of the units come through. So in a learning cycle, data collection, mm-hmm. um, and learning how to how to pick survivors in this cycle and then implementing all of that, it actually played through in, in 2003. Through. And if and if it wasn't for Vetri, probably I wouldn't get the chance to have, to be what I do today. Okay. How do you judge, you know, value in a business and, you know, how difficult it has been to find value and quality together uh, hmm. all these years? Uh, so, um, okay, the, per- the normal perception of value or, or quality, mm-hmm. okay, and if you want to get, get to quality, I think the last five years or last six years, you have said quality at a price, okay, and if you have to buy a quality business, Quality is often understood as companies with a ROE of 15% to 20% and 20%. But when you go down that path of an established business around for a long time, you usually get it at an extremely sovereign price. Mm-hmm. So then you have to shell out a lot of money for buying great businesses, right? So if I just step back for a minute and try and address how do you buy quality at a price? Okay. Take an industry is going through a down cycle. Buy the largest. Okay. Mm-hmm. In all probability, you'll get it free of cost. Okay. And when I say free of cost, you get it at pennies to the dollar. So looking for sectors which are in the down cycle. So what happens in a down cycle? In a down cycle, like we have, like we've seen in multiple scenarios, right? Now we today, uh, the biggest biggest story in the marketplace is capital goods uh, because everyone's talking about uh, uh, in the expansion of infrastructure, mm-hmm. power capex actually uh, taking place, but None of this was there between 2015, say, to 2019 or 2020. And how these companies were trading below book? Mm-hmm. Half and more were trading below book. Now, it's a patience game, okay, where everyone wants growth. Yeah. But you have to pay the price for growth. But if you have to pay the price for value, you're getting it for pennies to the dollar. Mm-hmm. And that's the space that we try to optimize. Okay. Optimize. So, while we, we choose a business, uh, which is uh, which is out of favor. We usually buy the best company in that entire sector ahead of the curve. While it is oh. still depressed, why way ahead of the curve and okay. probably participate every time it comes mm-hmm. up because that's the only time you will get a high quality business uh, at a, at a price that you want it to be. And then you write the cycle and then you write the cycle with it. Now, now. It may be a patience game, but if I just step back into my career and, and some of the businesses that we bought in 2006, 7, 8, 9, right, a lot of them were in the consumer franchise business, mm-hmm. right? You take a Bata, Glaxo, Switzerland, consumer, Asian, Asian, Asian industries. industries. 
right? Now the names of them were all similar and all of them were available at a 10% cash flow yield. Mm -hmm. 10% cash flow? Cash flow yield. Mm -hmm. Value? Today they are all available at 50 times to 100 times earnings. Mm -hmm. Growth? So the market shifted from value to growth with the same names. Okay. Today all the names which in 2015 to 2020 or sometime back also were all the cap name cap good names and if you go back to 2019 the CAGR on, on Larson and Dubrow was 1% mm -hmm, mm -hmm. over the decade it was 1% yeah. and that wasn't true for the last three years value to growth okay so that's all you try to do you try to anticipate it and if you have to try and anticipate it and try to pick the cycle right you try to pick the cycle right in in probably all formats you will get a great business at a at a, at a price there at different points in time even today you have a business hitting a 50 to week low mm -hmm. a good quality large business hitting a 50 to week low and that's where the focus and tension has to go so value being value mm -hmm. look for 50 to week lows okay so buying you buying uh, you, the the moment the time you buy is the most important thing Yes. That is the critical thing here. It's always the price. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I define my. You my, have to buy it at your price. Yes. And I how define. How do you arrive at it? So my job and I and I and I and I transition this down to my my team. Our job is to buy high capital efficiency at a price. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And that's the way we do it. So if I had to look at it, buy a business which has got low margins. Buy a business that has got low ROEs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Exit a business which has got high ROEs. All right. So and those, those companies themselves will actually move this path. Take a large business with low ROE, either the business closes down, mm -hmm. the industry closes mm -hmm. down, or it revives itself. How often you have been wrong with this? Uh, a couple of times, mm -hmm. uh, but I wouldn't say I was wrong with it. I was very early into the cycle. So I mean, I learned, it didn't work out at all. It didn't, it, it didn't work out. I wouldn't say it never worked out. I probably missed the opportunity to waiting for the right price. You missed it though. So as it corrects, I just wait a little too long, mm -hmm. and then you that don't get it the right. That's that's just test patience. So all your ideas don't come from any screening or any such thing or of another fund manager's portfolio. You have your own universe and you have a, your own watch list. We have our watch list, okay, and uh, and it's fairly it's I mean it, it, it's fairly easy to put it together. But I think. Formal portfolio management or formal funds management after three decades of doing the same thing again, you learn to make lesser mm -hmm. mistakes. So you just wait for the price. And mm -hmm. our job is to buy low, sell high. Mm -hmm. So where do you look for businesses which are which are, which are at the lower end of their uh, industrial cycle or their business cycle? And wait for the time you will get it right. So you know, in this whole investment decision, is it all logical number or you know there is some gut? feeling instinct you know th that also uh, plays a role here i think experience drives the gut okay okay uh, but if numbers are not supporting it you will be off it completely yes. is, so is there any such exception that comes your way no so if you ask me this question 15 minutes 15 years back i would have said the gut plays a big role to it mm -hmm. okay uh, simply because uh, there was not as much experience to establish what you did wrong at that point in time. So today, I think uh, we've been through multiple cycles and multiple market cycles. Okay, from a valuation cycle to an industrial cycle, you've got, you had 2008, you had 2019, 20, mm -hmm. okay, and you had 2013. Now, 2013 was a blinder. Beginning of this financial year and end of last financial year, 700 companies were making 50 to week lows. Okay. This year was a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. So there was a, there, there's a science. There, this is all established science. Basically, history reinvents itself. Mm -hmm. You just have to wait for your time. It repeats. So, or it rhymes. It rhymes. Yes. Uh, so you know you are known as a cyclical. Uh, you know, known to invest in cyclical and you know, a down and attractive sector. Which sector looks most the most attractive today? Okay, we've somewhere I'm in the middle. I'm trying to get some tips for, for our, uh, you know, 
audience. Yes. Somewhere, um, I think somewhere a lot of it is known. We will mid cycle through what people perceive to be a, a large cap capex cycle market marketplace, mm -hmm. right? We are in the middle of the cycle. Uh, we are somewhere at the beginning or in the middle. I, mm -hmm. I, I won't want to choose the price mm -hmm. part, but there, there, this thing has legs to go because it's not about India going through a capex cycle. Globally, the world is going through a mm -hmm. capex cycle. And when you have the US trying to do 20, which is 23% of the world GDP trying to do that, Middle East with all the US dollars that it's got trying to do that, this capex cycle could be bigger than what you saw in the last round. Mm -hmm. Okay, and 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 somewhere the entire commodity piece is not falling into that logical space. Now, I it might sound intuitive that commodities do well, but I look at it in the other format. A lot of commodity businesses are still one-time price to book, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even now. Even now, can you be a little more specific about uh, any example? You take any some company? of the large steel mills. Okay, steel come. Okay, one-time price to book. You take some of the large. Uh, aluminium businesses, one time price book, mm -hmm. not in India, globally mm -hmm. also. And you can't have a rollout of any infrastructure without base, base primary metals. Mm -hmm. Now, if they are trading at one time price book, everything in that life cycle of those businesses are also trading reasonably cheap, mm -hmm. which is basically the mining businesses, etc. They are all playing at dividend yield. Now, I don't know the future of that business, but I know for sure that there is no downside to it all. Things will not get worse. You can't lose money. Okay. Okay, and that's a way what establishes a portfolio. First, you've got to protect your downside. Mm -hmm. Your upside will come because the marketplace gives that market. Mm -hmm. to you. And I think that's around the corner. So the way we the way we are looking at and and when you ask me which, which stocks look valuable or which mm -hmm. stocks are, are, are have have reasonable value, is I think the entire commodity cycle has it. Mm -hmm. Now, metals could be just one part of it all. Mm -hmm. If you look at agro commodities and processors, that's the second leg of it all. Okay. So, right through the chain, what's happening in India and, and somewhere um, we, we, we've we been looking at a lot of these businesses. For the last 30 years, there's the commodity cycle in India, the commodity companies in India today add 10% or 15% of incremental capacity mm -hmm. without recourse to debt. Plus, they are debt free. Mm -hmm. Now, put mm -hmm. it together. I am adding 15% of incremental capacity with my own cash flows. Own cash flow. You don't need to go for debt, debt anymore. I've taken financial solvency out. Mm -hmm. So I am solvent as a business. Now I'm waiting for the cycle to come through. Mm -hmm. When you add to the capacity. Yes. So, uh, and this is what is currently present. You have a company with X amount of capacity currently. Mm -hmm. Debt free and making profits. Have you ever seen balance sheet this deliveraged? Never. Never in the past. The last time it was 2005, 6, 7. Mm -hmm. This time it's better. This time it's, it's, it looks like you know nobody is willing to borrow. It's not uh, no one's willing to borrow. It's, 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 the problem is, and I wrote this in the last newsletter to our investors. 2015, all Indian investors looked at corporate balance sheets and said too much of debt. Mm -hmm. 2023, you look at corporate balance sheets and you said too much of equity. Yeah, okay. okay. It has diluted the earnings. It diluted your ROE, which is the biggest risk to the marketplace. So, how do we, where do we go from here? So, we are not wrong when you say that there, there will be a corporate, corporate cycle or a capex cycle in the environment. Okay, India might have it for sure. Uh, not because of anything else, but we still have a, uh, we still have a very huge cash balance in place. Now, the thing is whether we use it productively or we use it unproductively. Now, I'm creating a scenario in the future, okay. Now, productively means we chip in with incremental capacity. Mm -hmm. Infrastructure. Yes. Businesses. The problem is that we've got too much of cash with the banks mm -hmm. and with the corporates to be material for, for a very large capex drive. Mm -hmm. So, then you do it unproductively. You go out and buy assets, okay. We have seen price for that. But when that starts, it starts with a very logical framework for the few first few assets that will have, will go, that will get acquired, will be acquired at a reasonably good ROI mm -hmm. and then it starts deteriorating. So, you are referring to the time when Tata's went ahead with their acquisition, global acquisition or? They did it at the end. They did it at the end, okay. So, if I take you a small journey back to 2003 mm -hmm. and 2004, I think it was, uh, or a little earlier than that, Gammon India. A company that no longer exists, exists yeah. in its original format had got three BOT projects, mm -hmm. okay, at an IRR of an unbelievable 29%. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Okay. Twenty nine percent. Yes. But then the cost of his funding was at fifteen percent. Mm hmm. So it didn't look very hmm. great. I was looking at you know one fixed deposit of BHEL which is which was available at fourteen percent in nineteen eighty one. Yes. <laughs> so there were bonds at seventeen percent. Seventeen percent. And eighteen percent as in the and late nineties. And government 90s. of India tax free bonds were also were also at eleven yes. percent. So. And and when the cost of financing moved from that fourteen fifteen percent to six percent and seven percent, the value of the asset moved up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we and then the final couple of road contracts that went or the BOD projects that went in went in with IRRs of eight, nine, ten percent. So you see the difference of the first mover and the last mover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have seen many projects actually falling through. You know, yes. the the biggest example is while coming to our office, you would have traveled D N D D N D, and that was a toll. That's a toll free thing now. Yes. Yes. So the so the simple thing is, and it it's that basically that was the BOT project, you know, build, operate, and transfer. So these are all. This is this is basically a mathematical simulation on you keep your return on capital employed higher than your cost of capital, you remain solvent, mm -hmm. and remain solvent, and remain solvent. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, uh, things move the other way around. Is when you when you continue to keep projecting your cost of capital will falling and make all the mistakes. Mm -hmm. and so go about. Just mismanaging the things. Yes, yes, yes. So I think this is what will eventually, uh, eventually, eventually happen with India. So the cyclical part of it is playing out. Too much of capital on book, that is going into some logical investments that are there, but it's going to get into illogical territory, like all bull, like, like all all. It that is also very cyclical. Uh, it's extremely cyclical. Too much mm. of money drives mm. people to do abnormal, so abnormal. Mm. So, so but the, that's some time away, and and you need that to get outsized gains in your equity markets. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a question from uh, which I have put here, which has come from our equity person Ikram. Uh, how do you assess a company's decision to either invest in capacity or pay out dividends to shareholders? Uh, is the right decision? Okay. And which sector do you see the scenarios playing out today? So today, India has got a lot of cash on balance sheet. They don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, if I look at historical return on equity or capital mm -hmm. equity, it's been fifteen percent to almost twenty five percent. This twenty five percent was in two thousand and six, seven, eight. Mm -hmm. If I'm a shareholder of that business, and I would want the company to reinvest that capital at the same ROE. Yes. Okay. If he doesn't have the opportunity, he pays it out. Okay. But the problem with paying out too much of dividends sir, is that you get valued at bond valuation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, nobody nobody factors any growth. Exactly. They stop giving any credit for any exactly. potential growth okay. because even the company is 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 indicating the fact that take away all the cash flow because I do not know what to do mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. So when you get into that kind of a matrix, it becomes a little difficult to quantify or substantiate. You will trade at an X amount of valuation. Right, and these are all physical assets which are on the ground. Mm -hmm. We're not a very big proponent of companies paying us capital back. Mm -hmm. And dividends. dividends is a wrong way to. I uh, might say dividends is a wrong way to uh, reward the shareholders. Buybacks are more make much more sense mm -hmm. because for a simple reason is when you buy back stock, you reduce shareholder capital. Equity. So it influences my return on equity. It improves it. Yes. Yes. Okay. And dividend actually signals a negative thing. And dividends, as I don't know what to do with capital. Mm -hmm. So that is just a form, but, but uh, you know the real situation hasn't changed at all. A buyback or a dividend, it yes. means the same thing for it, the company. Yes, but as a dividend, my return on capital, return on equity remains static. Mm -hmm. In a buyback, I'm doing two things: I'm returning shareholder capital, and I am increasing my shareholding, my share mm -hmm. in the company itself. So in both cases, both can hit cyclical highs. In the next cycle, both can get in the next cycle in the business. But the one with the lower equity benefits larger. Benefits more. So, how can an investor use cycles to improve their investment return? You know, you will be doing this with the portfolio. Mm -hmm. Can you explain some example, a couple of parameters to watch out for here? So, uh, so, so when we talk cyclicality, right, and when we talk value investing, right, uh, and and the other extreme, we talk compounding. So what is value investing? Value investing, everyone says, is buy cheap, mm -hmm. right? And that's what value investing is all yes. about. Everyone has different parameters of how to define it as cheap. 
in our format is when you when you try to buy a business which is at the bottom end of the entire cycle right at the bottom end of the entire cycle and in an industrial cycle you are waiting for a cyclical recovery when the cyclical recovery comes you have earnings growth mm-hmm. right and now i bring in compounding compounding happens when you have earnings growth and you have price earning multiples steering up okay and you have two parameters working for you and if i'm buying a business at 30 times or 35 times earnings one is fixed mm-hmm. only earnings growth will come down it's only variable yes so so that's how we try and uh, compartmentalize ourselves to look for uh, for for a cyclical business on on a down cycle and like i said every business is cyclical there's nothing structural about a business when you are Consumer. referring to you know this uh, every business is cy- cyclical yes. uh, are you saying in the context of the market is there is stock price in the marketplace or, or you are talking of the underlying business underlying business underlying business, underlying business. excluding the consumer no so, i'm getting there okay not even consumer business so when in the last 3 years when consumer companies are talking about inflationary pressures and mm-hmm. inability to pass on pricing hikes they are going through a cyclical down cycle okay their pricing power is gone you take 2000 to 2009 mm-hmm. okay india's largest fmcg business gave you shareholder returns of 1% and look at his his earnings growth during that mm-hmm. period of time very similar acha earning was also growing at 1% why do you get glaxo smithkline bata page industry ration pays between 12 times earning to 18 times or 20 times earning mm-hmm. why did you get it and why did you buy tata motors at 40 times earning and nlnd at 60 times earning during the same cycle Because what was structural and what is cyclical early days of uh, revival of the earnings for the, for those companies ha so what was structural and what was cyclical mm-hmm. Okay, so every business has to redefine their marketplace to grow into the next cycle. In past interviews, you have talked about investing as buying at low margins and selling at high margins or buying low. Exactly, you know what you said at the outset. Uh, and selling high ROEs. Can you elaborate any ex- recent uh, examples which we can relate to? Okay, uh, so step back. Uh, uh, I mean the most the most obvious ones were the were the entire metal cycle that you saw okay. that went through it just flew through us uh, mm-hmm. our cycle the other one that always plays out is the automotive cycles mm-hmm. okay covid everyone's margins collapsed everyone's ROEs went to single digits the covid was the outlier no? no everybody's earnings disappeared so you go the prior price, to no? covid okay. and automotive wasn't coming through and look at post covid i think you're catching up for 3 4 years of a down cycle that was coming through and everything is coming back again while automotive is one uh, you had the chemical market for a 12 year or 15 year period was going through a down cycle because of enormous amount of capacity creation outside the world and it all came back and formed a big gigantic bubble in indian chemical businesses in india about the most recent was the pharmaceutical cycle 2015 peak at yeah, the patent peak everyone rushed into saying the generic market is the next best thing all indian companies put in capacity all us companies bought out generic capacities over the world Okay, and twenty, twenty one, twenty two. You saw, so all of those hit fifty two week or four five year lows. Yeah, yeah. Okay, look at how that matrix has changed today. That that coincided with the FDA mess that was also on. Yes, yeah. but what happened with Indian companies was very simple. You had Indian companies which are solvent. The U.S. companies went had enormous amount of leverage debt. plus they had a lot of fines that were coming from so balance sheets got stretched in the us and indian companies were sitting pretty with cash on balance sheet mm-hmm. now who has the opportunity to scale okay so this is the indian context of pharma consolidating something that is a way of consolidating the global footprint okay step back 2000 to 2010 it did the same thing okay you had one or two companies there in all in all orders or bidding for most orders but after 2005 the us companies didn't exist mm-hmm. okay eds was a very large brand no longer exists compact and hp had a very strong services brand along with digital equipments no longer exists all the services business got off shore and you see and a they set up their shops there. here they shut in huh? and they shut down there mm-hmm. and they set up shops here and the indian companies went out and got more market share so all you need to be through a cycle to remain through a cycle is stay solvent and you solve it being alive is the most important thing always the case yeah, yeah. in your experience you know which are better long term investment structural or cyclical i think uh, um, one leads to the other and mm-hmm. as like i say that you have long term and uh, long terms cyclical journeys in 
in every industry. Okay. okay. So, I, I, I try and put it in a very simplistic way. Every industry grows at GDP growth level. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, to grow faster, you have to leverage it. So, watch the banks. Mm -hmm. Figure out what they are leveraging and that industry is going to go faster. Okay. So, that ends up being structural till it hits another cyclical patch. Mm -hmm. So, they will go through their own They will go cycle. through their same cycle because the banks uh, across the world uh, go and leverage uh, the fastest growing business because the fastest growing business needs uh, capital to grow. Okay. And as incrementally as they continue to keep growing, more money gets channeled out there it. till the banks create their own competition. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that turns cyclical all over again. That reminds me of Jet Airways, you know, it was in news today. So, so if you just step back, whether it is, or at least from our framework, I don't think there is anything which is structural in nature. There are survivors of the cycle. Okay. Okay. And those businesses get larger with every, uh, every transition that keeps coming back, every industry cycle that keeps coming back. So, through our investment footprint or when you look at larger investors that are there across the world, they will always look at companies which, which have, have longevity. Mm -hmm. So, if you have a company which has got a longevity of 50 years, undoubtedly you have made money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you exist, yes. You have made money. Mm -hmm. So, all focus, irrespective of whether you are buying growth businesses or value businesses, you have to stress the point that you have to buy longevity. Mm -hmm. It will help you go through a cycle and in that cycle, you will also get a structural piece of, uh, um, of the action. Okay. No, but in this case, when you have to buy such companies, have you ever gone wrong that, you know, here is a company which existed for 50 years mm. and Tata is still at one point looks like it's going towards bankruptcy. Yes. So, and it gets very close to bankruptcy, mm. a hundred year old business. Yes. Uh, so, how often you've gone wrong there? Um, the cycle, if it just does not turn around. There's no such thing as cycle not turning around. Okay. If uh, Tata Steel had gone bankrupt, uh, then it would have taken the entire steel industry with it. Okay. 1999, two companies in 98, 1999, two companies in, in, in the world were solvent. Tata Steel made a 60 crore profit during one of those years. The other one was Nucor in the US. Okay. Okay, Which and obviously the steel Russian recycling company. company. Yeah. Other, obviously, the Russian companies at that point in time. Okay, now if Tata Steel went bankrupt or Nucor went bankrupt, what would happen? There would be no steel available across the world. Mm -hmm. So yes, there are industries that go uh, that that ha do not have longevity. I've come across uh, the color picture tube market once yeah. upon a time. Sam tell here. Yes, you come across Moser Bear at one mm. point in time, which was floppy disks. Okay? So, you have a generation change in technology which happens and some companies fall by the wayside. Mm -hmm. So, it's very important to actually track a lot of those businesses transitioning. They were dangerous business, you know, they virtually disappeared. And also because, you know, the, the quality issues which came with the promoter of those times. Sure. So, so there is... Over the longer term period, do not, I am, I'm not worried about falling into value traps. Okay. Okay. Because uh, a portfolio construction, portfolio construction takes care of those mistakes. Mm -hmm. okay. So, as long as they are not a very senior, unless, uh, un unless you are extremely, extremely concentrated having only one stock portfolio, you mm -hmm. can be completely wrong. Okay. And which is what value research always has. Um, has influenced their investors. It's like diversify your portfolio. Yeah, of course, you know, yes. I, one can't be sure of exactly uh, uh, something all the time. Yes, yeah. which is why we run, mm -hmm. we run diversified portfolios. Now, the diversification for different managers could be very different. Okay, I'm comfortable with a 20 stock portfolio, 25 stock portfolio, because in at the back of my mind, I'm not playing the marketplace. I'm playing my competencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's what I want to put forward in the portfolio there. So, yes, there are value traps. I will get one or two. It has happened. Okay. Uh, it has happened as recent as 2017 and 2018 and 19. We went searching for value mm -hmm. where there was none available. The mid cap market was at its all time high, the small cap. Small cap okay. And the mistake that we made was we looked for value when there was no value to be found mm -hmm. and where we teared down in terms of the quality of businesses. Okay. Okay. The reason why a company trades cheaper than the next company is for a reason. It's never without a reason. It's never without a reason.
market never it, that you know it is never misplaced market is so where do you how do you create alpha if market is you know always right so like i say it's always the price hmm. acha it's always the price and at points in time uh, uh, capital around the world is like a herd instinct hmm. uh, all rush whether it is equity cap equity money available for equity investing or money which is with the banks they always migrate to the best performing sector so step back what do you want to do and once you define what you want to do i, I think getting an output out of it or getting get, to be able to leverage that opportunities i think that's where all the all the alpha gets created mm -hmm. so when do you sell something was at a down cycle went up mm -hmm. then when do you actually say that okay it's it's more than enough so this is now it is getting one. into a risky strategy uh, territory so this is an interesting question because uh, uh, because selling in the sell selling discipline selling a winner yes yep. the sell dis discipline doesn't come very naturally to most of us okay uh, but the data point that i use and which i also um, um, uh, try to institutionalize but i still have to formalize a process around that i must mm -hmm. say that okay is that when every company in an industry is making money that's a very dangerous place to be okay okay now it's a common sense approach to why i say that right now when everyone makes money what are those companies doing they reinvesting in their existing business yes right so they're bringing in capacity more than what demand exists mm -hmm. then adjacent industries are also putting in capital looking at their rois mm -hmm. more capacity i created so the way i put and numerically if you have to put it together if an industry is making a 30% return on capital employed there's always a private equity investor says my return on capital of employed hurdle is 15% mm -hmm. okay and he will fund it and he will fund, fund it the competition yes and the bank say that my 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 hurdle rate is 9% mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so in the longer term the whole industry return on capital employed comes to 9% comes to 9% now i am seeking some tips from you which is which sectors and industries are at their uh, cyclical low and could be a great entry point hmm. so um uh, one agrochem okay uh, it's got got to rent this year my sense is still some way from bottoming but you're getting price points which are nice okay attractive nice. not very attractive but nice mm -hmm. Okay. Second is I have spoken some time back about commodities. I have never seen companies in India generating this kind of cash flow, adding capacity, uh, adding capacity on the ground without debt. Without debt. Without debt. So you are finding new capacity with the same amount of leverage or lower leverage. Lower leverage. And obviously the third one, which is interesting, and I have been saying this for the last eighteen uh, months, is uh, IT services, especially the big caps. Mm -hmm. Okay. now what gives away that is fairly simple one of the largest largest companies in that entire space has hit its hit almost a 6% mar margin mm -hmm. okay in the last quarter and i think that's trenched and that's dropped the margin is dropped so you're close to the bottom as far as business operations are concerned 6% margin actually scares you because you know a little bit of currency movement and that can become zero yes which is what why it's reflecting in price in price price today so you get negative news you get price point mm -hmm. you get positive news you get price earning multiple mm -hmm. so which of the two you have to choose this is investor but what will cause a turnaround uh, so that's something you don't sit down and predict these are multi billion dollar companies mm -hmm. right and that 6% margin is for a number of reasons apart from the fact that it's also had a weak quote but as a whole the whole basket of companies are hitting lower this numbers. kind of return on it mm -hmm. so uh, So fun functionally, this industry is never going to close down. There are questions around AI, mm -hmm. lower lo lower growth for the business sector, but these are large businesses who will go on to dominate your technology. And so you do as long as you, like I said in the beginning, as long as you don't question longevity of a business, ah, these companies won't die. As long as you don't, die, you will get a significant mm -hmm. turnaround. So the turning triggers could be anything. Could be may not be improvement in the margins, but just scaling up. further from here it all reflects on the underlying business right mm -hmm. so you sell at a all time high in terms of margin and buy at a all time low margin but people extrapolate the top to be higher and expect the okay. low to be lower lower it's okay. like 
equity investing mm-hmm. okay and doing the reverse of how to make money so uh, my ex boss how one of my ex bosses actually said it framed it very nicely people come into the equity markets wanting to make 15% return and leave the equity markets trying to save the last 15% mm-hmm. this is a interesting question based on your earlier interview you have said earlier that uh, you know this decade belongs to government cap capex mm-hmm. and uh, which non psc industries stand to gain from this opportunity i think the whole value chain does it because government capex is cement the steel start. everything uh, it's only the start of it all so mm-hmm. everything in the entire value chain will actually benefit so every 100 rupees that uh, goes into infrastructure 40 rupees goes into employee cost or labor mm-hmm. 60 rupees goes into material okay now you there's a kind of margin there's a kind of break up and that's a break up now you can have your preferences and put a valuation chart next to it and you got your numbers uh if consumer facing businesses are likely to face inflationary pressure, pressure this decade are there small niches or segments you think will continue to do well in this case of course i i think urban consumption is a great play mm-hmm. urban consumption yeah because uh, all said and done uh, india is also evolving and if you have to see uh, india gdp go from 3.5% of the world population mm-hmm. sorry 3.5% of the world gdp to 5.5% of the world gdp we've got to import that growth mm-hmm. when we have to import that growth we are importing international we importing um in, we we have imported inflation coming in mm-hmm. and it is very rampant in what we see as services in the services economy okay india's per capita incomes especially in in places where are feeding into the services economy globally are going to move very close to western western economy wage rates okay. and that's how we import higher gdp mm-hmm. growth right so track that faction of the market that earnings will actually be a consumer player as, yes, well. as well track that faction of the market and the sim- and the simplest point that you're seeing across india right now is in the real estate market mm-hmm. so take every individual's balance sheet in the country real estate is the largest part of your balance sheet yes okay if you do not like buying a house take your income statement your biggest expenditure line is rentals that's where inflation in an inflationary economy that's where inflation fits into your uh, consumer place with the increasing competition and pricing pressure in the us what are the prospects for indian pharma industry for the next couple of years what will set the winners apart uh, i think it's uh, um, I mean, whether it's pharmaceuticals or whether it is IT, I think it's the same. Mm-hmm. Or whether it's services imports, it's the same. Or whether it is steel exports, it's the same. Right? We've, we've or let me put it differently. Also, whether it's automotive or whether it is two wheelers or whether it is um, engineering, India is over capacity in every single metric. Mm-hmm. Right? We produce far more number of cars than we can sell into the economy. We we are largest steel manufacturers or the second largest steel manufacturers in the world with the lowest cost. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got more pe- people in mo- employed in services and IT than India has an economy needs, and in pharmaceuticals it's the same. Mm-hmm. Right? So we we got the lowest cost benchmarks that are there, feeding into the world's largest economies. So we are actually reducing their cost. Exactly. So we're going to be a perpetual part of the entire supply chain, and it started off with chemicals, and it started with chemicals and number of other parameters that number of industries. But it's cutting across every single industrial line. So somewhere, uh, what what the world's largest manufacturing economy doing? We are doing it. We are doing it with de- very different industries. Okay, and and pharma is one of that fits right in there. We got. the largest plants whether it is injectables or whether it is generics you got companies that have in, invested in biosimilars you got companies some of the largest vaccine companies in the country you name it we've got mm-hmm. we've all of it yeah we've all of it and we've got to find our niche everywhere else in the world also becoming a little more world. compliant with fda stake i think our compliance is there it's not up there it's there mm-hmm. 
so they will there won't be an issue with the longevity or you know a disruption no, in their business because i don't think there's going to be an issue as far as longevity is concerned mm-hmm. because we con- consistently remain bottom end uh, cost manufacturers of of pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical ingredients globally now i have a set of question which is going into the past hmm. uh, what are the big lessons you know that, that you have you know big mistake and what lesson that you got so i think 2017 18 uh, and 19 was was probably the most horrendous part of my career your career okay and i glad that's that that was also the early days of your pms business that's right that's right so we had a we had a roaring 2017 and in the back of that roaring 2017 we from a portfolio perspective we we tried to look for value when there was not none there and quite contrary to where uh, i would have wanted to be we move downwards instead of moving sideways mm-hmm. okay and that's where mistakes came in the portfolio okay it took us about two and a half three years almost four years today if i look at a cajr from the start it's not so bad okay. but those two years definitely did impact how how the cyclicality or how being at the right place with the wrong strategy, wrong strategy. impacted long term so you did what you are telling me right now that should not be done it should never be done never tear mm-hmm. down from an institutional portfolio especially if you are a very large shareholder to business mm-hmm. so what is the way to actually avoid such accidents because there could be another one there will always be an accident and there will always be a new learning cycle mm-hmm. but if you ask me about my past this was probably the biggest one that was there okay okay incrementally you have to make sure that you are you are disciplined enough to make sure your portfolio is reasonably balanced at all points at all points so when today everyone's looking at a growth market for something that turned value and mm-hmm. looking at growth okay uh, i think that's a mistake that you need to avoid how difficult when were you able to recognize that okay this is something which you have you have gone wrong very early very early that's something which i don't see happening very often now a question which has been asked already that is it more difficult to keep holding on to your big winner or to your book big loser uh i think holding on to your big winner comes naturally mm-hmm. holding on to your biggest loser becomes a bit of a mm-hmm. mindset block mm-hmm. okay and that is something that takes a lot of time to overcome so to answer the question straight it's easy to hold on to your biggest winner okay okay and that's essentially where it comes from and i and uh, and if you step back and i always use my team as a reference point okay and every time this i i ask them the same question what's your biggest conviction and the biggest conviction always comes with price history of the last two years mm-hmm. and that ends up being your largest mistake so you know how you know how, there will be an exit point and there will be an entry point you know you get into something and then it falls freely 30% from that level yes because that is what the downside of your strategy is that yes. you ha- you might have to wait Uh, for a very yeah. long time or yeah. you have to witness you know 20 30% decline how do you overcome this how, no, do, how do you psychologically prepare yourself for this okay so that to other people's money the entire challenge comes or the entire challenge comes how convinced are you at 30% lower and 50% lower okay are you able to buy more exactly and that's what you have to realize because when you step into office or when i step into office or when i step into trade i have got to realize that my costing is based on yesterday's price Mm-hmm. and not on my original purchase so i have to build a portfolio starting yesterday because yesterday is when my my last investor came in and i have got to be fair to him like i like i believe i've been fair to everything that was in history okay and that's where the that's where the differentiation comes in uh, and once you've addressed that problem you know which part of your portfolio has got uh, froth and which part of your portfolio you need to continue to average mm-hmm. and that is the assessment and that's how we put portfolios together so you keep your investors in mind while you're cleaning up of course of course uh, uh, how difficult have been you know uh, managing pms as compared to an open end fund uh, uh, so there if i just step back into my history i've always been a uh, i've been always been a portfolio manager mm-hmm. for uh, 2000, 2002 to 2015 in the mutual fund space so pool structures work wonderfully okay single enemy work wonderfully and everyone gets gets what they see mm-hmm. and i think that's a structure that is uh, uh, 
that is that has always attracted me from what what we do so obviously a preference is uh, a simple structure which is what a mutual fund uh, structure does compared to a portfolio management product which is all managed account mm -hmm. smaller portfolio mm -hmm. there in terms of customizing a portfolio to individuals becomes a little bit of a um, uh, a, a process mm -hmm. so so over a period of time at so least all portfolios will be different in, all in terms of weightages yes weightages yes Okay, because if someone walks in today and one stock because of its historical performance is at 15% of the portfolio, which is currently is, I can't give him 15% because I'm giving historical performance. Okay. But that won't be the case of in an open end fund. Because in an open end fund, everybody will put his money into the same fund. Yes, but then you're correcting it, correcting it as money comes into the fund. Okay. So unless I'm buying 9% of the fund at a regular interval, I'm I, I'm doing injustice to it all. But if new money coming in and I'm increasing it at the bottom, which I'm doing in the portfolio management mm -hmm. plan, okay, then then over a period of time, that correction in course actually takes place. Mm -hmm. You are about to get your asset management license or you know, you are going to get a go ahead. Uh, how it is going to be your uh, mutual fund business? Okay, we are as you transition from PMS to, uh, uh, you know, a mutual fund. So we are an investor led uh, when I say investment-led asset management company, right? And for us, an investment-led asset management company is is quite simple. The product has to do all the talking, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so there are a, a few expectations that are uh, our that 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 I think investors would expect out of us. But it's a process of taking it in steps, building a portfolio, letting it mature, and and making sure that you are ahead of. Of indices and with your peer group at demonstrate the same demonstrate and then go to trade. So it's going to be a slow process, like mm -hmm. it was with our asset man with our with our uh, advisory uh, portfolio management and our AI license. It's going to be a gradual process of a build up of uh, how we want to do. We are in the business of making money. Okay. Okay. And we we'll never forget that, like like the startups of nowadays. Yes. So <laughs> we are not in the business of actually collecting capital. So we'll go slow. We'll build it up over a period of time, and our product has to do more talking than uh, than our advertisements. How do you look at the you know the startups which are continually or perennially losing money, and uh, they lose even more to grow without any sight of you know a roadmap to make money? Well, it's not very different, and if you go to very different periods of time and in history also, if you go back to the U.S. in the 30s and 40s, the capital costs were very very low. Uh, you had a lot of incubation of businesses which are, which are not profitability driven but which are idea driven mm -hmm. and then cost of capital became expensive. Okay. So what you had uh, in India and the rest of the world was an incubation of ideas. Now the ideas have to be profitable. Mm -hmm. So now you are seeing a consolidation of that space. So this is cyclicality of that business playing out. They are available, they are solvent till capital flows stop and they have to start generating their own capital. Mm -hmm. So you think most of them will survive? Have you taken a closer look at any of them? Of course, a lot of them will be there in, into the next decade. A mm -hmm. lot of them. A lot of them. Okay, but you just got to buy them at, at what you think is a relevant price. Because it's very expensive to create footprints that some of these companies have done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in the consolidation of that space, they're creating virtual monopolies. And when you create virtual monopolies and they are go-to businesses, then of course they've got a business model. Mm -hmm. Now they've got to price it. Now they have to figure out how to make money. Yes. So, but they might lose customers if they start making money. So maybe first they would have got that customer base. Mm -hmm. So even for paying customers, if they hadn't gone down their path, they wouldn't know what were paying customers. Mm -hmm. So you created the customer base. Now you have to shrink the customer base and become profitable. Become profitable. So you get selective. Then. You get very selective. Mm -hmm. What is your view on gold? Should Saber put any money in gold in any form? I think it's an asset allocation structure that is there. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and I don't, I, I really don't want to comment on whether it's it's gold or whether it's equity or whether mm -hmm. it's real estate. Every investor has made money in 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 gold, in real estate, in equities, okay. in bonds. Okay, and it depends upon the DNA of that that investor. Uh, to maximize maximize profitability of that particular commodity or cycle. I mean, people have been enormous amount of money in art too. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, but you just have to be selective and get it at the right price. Uh, so I am now done with most most of the question, except that you know I have some questions which you which is about you. Okay. Uh, no, but one more question. This sure. whole talk about you know active versus passive index funds actually becoming mainstream. Yes. Uh, so do you think you know if your days are over? Oh, my days are over. <laughs> <laughs> In so, the sense of, you know, you, you owe it to active management being selected. So look at passive management, right? Passive management is polarizing money into things that are doing well. Mm-hmm. I'm doing exactly the opposite. Passive money is about polarizing money mm-hmm. into things that are doing well. So if you have the index, which is taking all the money, they are the top 50 companies because they have done well. Mm-hmm. That creates an opportunity at the bottom end of the structure. So, passive money buys indexation, I buy It's creating opportunity for you? It obviously creates an opportunity at the bottom end of the spectrum. How dangerous it is because you know many of these, the amount of money flowing into passive and it's just a very mathematical exercise. Mm. This much money goes into this, this, this. So, uh, there are lousy companies and uh, they also get a standard allocation. And that's fine. I, I think it's the market cycle and that's what diversification does, right? And then even in passive funds, you got 50 companies in the Nifty 50, you mm-hmm. got 100 funds in the BA, Nifty 100 and you got 200 companies in the Nifty 200. Not all of them are equal weighted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there are companies that uh, will get enormous amount of money and there are companies will get no amount of money and I am outside that basket. Mm-hmm. So what is my endeavor? My endeavor as an asset manager is to find those companies will, which will go there. Okay, if I started with an index of 100, I have to reach that indexation of 1000 before those businesses come into the nifty. Now, what drives 100 to 1000 is what is, is what, return, whatever, whatever. Exactly, exactly. And that's how, how the skill set of an active manager comes into play. Mm-hmm. So, we will never be out of style. It depends upon, uh, we might be in flavor and like not out of favor. Out of favor, but that's uh, that's that's a cycle that we would have to take. I mean, there's a risk to a business. Right? How long has been the sad cycle in your in the while you're trying to bet on the cyclicality of this thing? So 2003 to 2023. Okay, I have underperformed the market about four four times. Four times. Are you referring four to years? Four calendar years, years or calendar year? years? Okay, calendar years. Okay, four years we've underperformed benchmarks. So, so it's been okay. Been okay. Okay. And this no, is post you know, phase. If you, if you get rewarded in the subsequent phase, then people don't mind that because one year waiting is not a big deal. Yeah. So, 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 I, so I'm having this conversation with you. I've had customers, customers on my portfolio management and advisory, and we've we had almost thirty percent direct customers when I used to manage uh, mm-hmm. portfolios at uh, my previous organization, right? So, we are having this conversation also because in the last 20 years and that's not me mm-hmm. alone but multiple more, more portfolio more managers and peer groups have always shown the demonstration and ability to come back with, uh, with, with performances mm-hmm. uh, which, which are significantly better or mm-hmm. better than the underlying benchmark wide margin. Yes. And that's 20 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, there, there are investors out there who have done it for longer but it's mm-hmm. 20 years and hopefully this cycle Continues. Uh, now beyond investing, what else do you do? Do you plan in your retirement sometime? Uh, I do plan my retirement and I plan my retirement around investment. <laughs> and that's the good part of being an entrepreneur and uh, having your own investment business because this is a business that has no age restriction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And yeah. the older you get, Mr. the lesser Buffett amount. is doing it at 94. Yes. And the older you get, the wiser you get, the mm-hmm. lesser mistakes you make. I won't say the wiser you get, the lesser mistakes you make. So with age, you you stop doing stupid things. Yes, it's like a bottle of wine. Mm-hmm. Okay, some contrarian questions. You know, I'm forced to, you know, some of these, your opinion. If somebody, you know, is was holding a gun to your head and asked to list good things about crypto, what would you say? Okay, it's, um, it's a... It's a fabulous instrument to do one, just one transaction, right? 
if i could if, if crypto is available across the world in the same format mm-hmm. i can buy it in indian rupees and take it out in the rest of the world in any currency mm-hmm. it's just the ability to transfer money across yeah, the world it's brilliant. And it's brilliant okay and i uh, and yes and that's and that's 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 the most positive thing that is there now it has to prove itself as a store of value mm-hmm. okay and eliminate the volatility which comes more because of regulation than everything else and if that is possible like gold okay and gold has has boundaries around how you can transfer gold from one country to the other and other country and if that and that works out well i think it uh, it it's a very legitimate it's a worthwhile thing to it's have a, it's, it's a very it's a nice way of transmitting money uh but otherwise as a vehicle or the way to speculate or you know no, uh, intrinsic no, no, worth no, no. it's got to be it's got to be an asset it got to be an asset it's, it's got to be a store of value lot of talk about you know finfluencers and all these people what's wrong with a broker or a mutual fund using a finfluencer now you will be a mutual fund or you are right now you are a pms mm. and some marketing initiative and you'll be tempted to you know use somebody's following to reach out to your audience so if it is declared is is it a problematic thing so i haven't given much thought to uh, something like this but i think what what necessarily for old bridge uh, mutual fund okay as we has we get on to this venture is first to look in internally to see whether your product is relevant it meets investor needs and then uh go through the necessary channels whether it is a broker mm-hmm. or whether it is a fin influencer or whether it's media or when no, i'm not asking more thing. in context of the sebi trying I, to regulate these guys then i think i i would use it as far as regulation is concerned i i leave it to the regulator to deem deem uh, appropriate what uh, uh oh, what parameters do the content mm-hmm. businesses or the influencers Uh, have to adhere to uh, to to for me to participate with them okay so thank you very much for all your answers and uh, sharing your insights with us thank so, you thank you very much kiran